Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you are in the United States. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you for this GMF conversation when we will discuss the EU-Turkey ag uh, agreement on migration and the situation of refugees or migrants uh, in Turkey. My name is Kadri Taştan, I'm GMF TOBB Senior Fellow with the GMF here in Brussels, and I'm running GMF Brussels Office Turkey program. And thank you very much for joining us today. Just let me first mention this online event is a part of series of uh, event organized as a part of GMF TOBB Fellowship on Turkey, Europe and Global is uh, Issues launched by GMF in partnership with the Union of Chambers and Commodity Exchange of Turkey in 2017. So we are uh, grateful to TOBB for this support. Five years have passed since the EU-Turkey refugee deal was signed to stop the flow of illegal uh, migration to Europe via Turkey and design th this uh, deal designed as a joint coordination mechanism to ensure that the needs of refugees and host communities in Turkey are addressed. Uh, but this EU-Turkey agreement is also is perceived as a controversial attempt at solving this issue. The most important part of this agreement is the European financial assistance to migrants in Turkey, and this financial assist assistance is. Uh, expiring now. And despite this agreement and the cooperation in the field of migration, this issue is also a source of tension from time to time between Ankara and Brussels. And, and at the end of February 2020, migrants were uh, encouraged by Ankara to take the land uh, route to Europe via Greece. And Ankara was accusing the Europeans of not helping uh, Turkey enough uh, to justify this decision. So in this context, Brussels is generally criticized for externalization of the EU migration governance to the third states, and Ankara is criticized of instrumentalizing uh, migrants. As you know, there are also non-immigration elements of 2016 declarations, such as relative, uh, sorry, the, to, 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 to bring again the accession negotiations in the uh, revitalization of the sorry of accession negotiations, custom union modernization, and visa liberalization. But we will not deal with this element of the declaration in this meeting. Our focus is mainly uh, migration. So Turkey continued to host millions of Syrian and also thousands of other refugees, and this has weighed heavily on countries for years. And everyone is asking the same question. Will the EU continue to cooperate with Turkey on migration? And if so, uh, uh, how? The recent EU strategy paper on re uh, or report uh, on Turkey, co-authored by High, Pre High Representative Joseph Borrell and the European Commission, recommends an offer to Turkey of uh, more financial help to host the refugees on the top of uh, 6 billion for, uh, euro for the last four years. And we will see if the European Council uh, comes up with a concrete proposal uh, on this subject tomorrow or uh, after tomorrow. But we see there are many things to discuss and today we gathered a very good, a very good group of experts to discuss uh, all these issues. Please let me first to introduce uh, you our distinguished three speakers in alphabetic order. We have Olivia Sandberg uh, Diaz. Uh, Olivia is a policy analyst, uh, analyst with the European Policy Center in Brussels. Then we have Omer Katkoy. Uh, Omer is a policy analyst uh, uh, at the Economic Policy Center Foundation of Turkey. And our third speaker is, uh, speaker is Pnar Uyan uh, Semerji. Uh, Pnar is Dean of Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities and also Director uh, for Center for Migration Research at the Istanbul Bilgi University. Olivia, Omer, and Pnar, thank you so much uh, uh, for joining us. Uh, in, for this discussion and of course so thanks to all of you for joining us today first of all as a moderator i will give the floor to our three speakers to have their introductory remarks and then of course we will open up uh, to all of you just to say that it's on the record and if you would like to put a question there's a q a function at the bottom of the zoom window and we will keep track of them and we will get as many uh, of you as we can and uh, please specify also maybe to whom you are asking your question. With this, Pnar, uh, uh, I would like to start with you. Maybe it would be great that uh, you could comment maybe the EU-Turkey migration deal from Turkish perspective, 
how could we see this deal after five years? It's success, failures, critic, critics against it, etc. Uh, do we need a new deal or current deal would be enough as a framework for cooperation? How the financial aspect of this cooperation uh, are, uh, is and uh, the prospect? And uh, of course, we would be also very much interested to hear your analysis on the legal nature of the EU to the Turkish statement from an international law uh, point of view. So with that, uh, over to you, uh, Pnar. Okay. Uh, then good evening, let's say, from snowy Istanbul. Um, I will try to be brief as much as possible. Uh, when I go over my uh, sort of general notes and analysis of uh, the deal, even the term that you use, Kadri, when you first refer to it as an agreement, then deal, is something that needs to be underlined. I think the whole issue is that uh, in Turkish, we also use the term agreement, deal, um, tabakat, uh, anlaşma. So even that terminology is very important because we know that it is not accepted as a treaty. And in that sense, it somehow uh, creates a gray area in which it's not binded by the sort of EU law and also international law. So this would be my first point that I would like to underline because I think in that sense, of course, there's a big debate. I mean, uh, as uh, some of our more like humanitarian perspective, it's really, really criticized of being morally bankrupt. I mean, this is sort of all challenging the refugee law. This is sort of the arguments that had been stated earlier. And sometimes even from, it's also criticized from more right perspective, uh, sort of ultra rights or radical rights, uh, why do we need to somehow support the Syrians in Turkish context so within Europe so there can be even sort of criticism from uh, the radicals let's say but uh, in Turkish context or let's say in general uh, there are big issues with respect to this whole deal, uh, the argument of a deal or a statement. I mean, the term is also used as a statement, uh, EU-Turkey statement. Why I underline this so much? Because I think this also reflects many different issues with respect to Syrians in Turkey. Most of the time when we are trying to explain what's going on, we always sort of try to clarify even some of the very basic arguments we need to say that Although this is the case, but actually the existing condition is blah, blah. So actually, I mean, as we, as you all know that uh, now it's 10 years, it's more than 10 years since the conflict in Syria that we have Syrians uh, coming from, uh, I mean, sort of um, as the definition, as they uh, run away from the conflict because of the war, then they are actually refugees. But as you know, within the Turkish uh, uh, sort of the Turkey does not uh, sort of recognize them as refugees and the first were sort of the concept that we used was uh, our guests which do not really uh, match to any kind of international law but then we had this temporary, uh, temporary protection status so even this terminology uh, how we frame how we name uh, the whole uh, sort of uh, forced migration from Syria itself is again an issue of conceptualization and sort of the right, why we can't uh, give the right name. So similar to that, uh, the EU-Turkish deal, uh, that sense, not naming as a treaty, not putting it into international law within the conditions of international law, not being binded by the EU law, I think that's also this whole creating gray areas uh, is a problematic issue which we need to be aware of. So again, another sort of uh, terminology that we will say we usually use irregular migrants uh, rather than illegal. But again, I mean, what is regularity? Uh, how can you be a regular or legal in that sense migrant in a position where you have all these problems in the area is something that we need to be aware of. Again, for those who are not very familiar with this situation, when we talk about uh, the number of the Sy Syrians in Turkish context under the temporary protection status, the number is 3.7 million. And of course, this is a huge uh, number, but again, underlying again and again, each number refers to a human being. So we are actually not really talking about numbers, but individuals 
having stories, having families, having been through many, many big problems and trying to survive. So in that sense, uh, although there are big criticisms, there are many um, debatable issues with respect to this deal, uh, still, as some of our colleagues underline, the sort of uh, responsibility that uh, certain financial support from EU to Turkey, uh, it's three plus, plus three billion euros, uh, we, do, we know that the first three had arrived, the second we don't know to what extent, and that's also another issue we can discuss because this transparency I think is also very important in terms of uh, how things going to uh, sort of change in the near future in Turkish perspective and so on. But what I'm trying to say is that this kind of financial support from EU is of course important because we're talking about uh, families, uh, people who are trying to sort of set their lives and sort of uh, receiving certain health care and also education. I mean, to some extent, I mean, although uh, there are many big problems with respect to this deal, so-called deal, uh, this sharing responsibility side, or at least a kind of perspective where we need to share responsibility, not only with Europe, of course, I mean, I think this is sort of a more uh, an exam, a sort of a test for the whole uh, human species, which I personally think that we didn't really succeed well. Uh, we failed to a very, very uh, high extent, but still, I mean, this sort of a uh, responsibility sharing framework is what I can say as sort of a, a little bit pro side, uh, sort of positive side of the whole deal. But when, I mean, you asked me to also refer to the Turkish uh, sort of perspective on this deal, I mean, um, when we had it first, I mean, this also creates a discussion in Turkish public opinion. Uh, in general, not of course only in Turkey, but we know that in general there's a sort of a uh, raising anti-immigrant attitudes. I mean, uh, with respect to our own research on polarization, uh, we consequently had modules on uh, attitudes towards Syrians questions. And we know that there's a sort of a high increasing number of um, an increasing percentage of sort of this anti-immigrant attitude, which we need to work on, which we need to first face it as a fact and then sort of uh, find ways to deal with it. But also, I think this whole deal and how it has been discussed in the media also had a reflection on Turkish um, sort of uh, Turkish opinion, public opinion, a negative perspective towards Europe. Uh, this also had been uh, seen as, I mean, as already stated in many various uh, sort of articles and also in other contexts, that uh, this fortress Europe argument, uh, Turkey being the fans and all these things like, I mean, uh, that uh, EU actually um, sort of setting certain criteria for Turkey, but never uh, for sort of uh, her own self and sort of this deal is a kind of a symbolic uh, way of seeing this. And uh, this I think is important that we need to keep in mind because when we talk to different groups in Turkey, when we conduct focus group analysis and so on, um, I mean, of course, uh, when you look at it uh, from the uh, sort of a citizen's, citizen's perspective that EU actually uh, sort of want to stop the territory, sort of movement and sort of uh, set this deal and uh, although there were some other issues with respect to the agreement, sort of the deal, uh, such as liberating uh, visa regime and so on, uh, that this didn't take place and only Turkey in a way uh, sort of keep the promises. Of course, we can debate on this to what extent this is true or not, but this is sort of the general uh, sort of public opinion. And I think in that sense, um, my own position is much more, as you already probably understand, that uh, I'm a much more human rights uh, 
perspective, having a refugee right, children rights perspective, which uh, in which I try to do my best in my research area, sort of to reflect what's going on and how people actually perceive and what can we do to change this sort of this uh, negative attitudes. But as uh, every time we deal with different groups and so on, we talk to different groups, we also need to underline that it's not something particular to Turkish context. And it's not about only like in Turkish context, Turks versus Syrians or towards Syrians, but in general, this whole issue of how come that uh, we, we actually move backward uh, from the refugee law uh, or universality of human rights claim. I mean, how come that uh, in the year of 2021, uh, we have this kind of a problem on the table um, on the issues of very, very basic rights of human and basic rights of children, that uh, we have a kind of deal in which other interests uh, are sort of giving priority than uh, human rights. So uh, maybe we can continue discussing on this. Let me, I mean, uh, let me stop here so that we will have more questions and discussion, I hope. Thank you so much, Pinar. Uh, so Omar, uh, let's continue with you if you wish. Uh, you can also comment the EU-Turkey migration deal briefly, but uh, it would be great if you could speak more maybe about the situation of Syrians in Turkey, the challenges, difficulties to their economic and social integration. And the feeling, even uh, against from your perspective, that uh, Pinar also spoke uh, about it. Um, you live in Turkey, but you have also Syrian background, and it's it's your research area. And it would be great to have your observation and uh, an an analysis uh, on that. And I, we would be really interested to hear also about the outcome of your recent report on the social equality of forced migrants, the role of municipalities and NGOs during the pandemic. Over to you, Oman. Thank you very much, and um, it's my pleasure to be with all of you. Um, let me start by saying that uh, the 10th anniversary of the Syrian revolution uh, marked our calendars a few days ago with great grief. And um, in the last few days or even weeks, many revisited what happened over the last decade and um, contemplated on Turkey's role from a humanitarian perspective. Uh, I had the opportunity to join a few events and I heard the following, which I, I believe to be a profound description of, of Turkey's role. Um, Turkey is carrying what is left of the 1951 Geneva Convention on its shoulders. And I believe that it's no wonder that Turkey is doing so because as, as, as Professor Pinar mentioned, there are 3.6 million Syrians under temporary protection. Uh, in Turkey, next to some 330,000 um, asylum seekers, mainly from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran and Somalia. So the subject is is not about only numbers. Uh, it's it's about millions of lives who are living in Turkey, and it's also about what Turkey has been providing them for um, in terms of protection, first and foremost and um, access to undisputable rights of education and health. And um, today we're, we're here talking about where are we five years after the EU-Turkey uh, migration deal. And I, I think I, that's a very good um, title to, to shed light on a few things. And I, I want to start by um, talking about the one third of Syrians in Turkey who are between the ages of, of five to 17. Um, According to, to the latest official numbers, uh, out of the 1.1 million Syrians in schooling age, 63% of them are enrolled in Turkish schools. And this is not only a sign of children's um, integration, if you ask me, but it's also um, a sign of their parents' integration because uh, they managed to navigate Turkish bureaucracy and enroll the children in schools. So this is, this is something that needs to be um, posed at. And of course, it's, it's worthy to mention that before the pandemic, there were official um, officials who expressed concerns that Syrian children already dropped out of um, secondary school and entered the labor market to help their uh, parents make ends meet. And actually there are estimates saying that there were, or there are 720,000 Syrian children who are engaged in economic activities up until 2019 or in 2019. So 
in the aftermath of the pandemic, unfortunately, Syrian children's um, enrollment in primary school decreased by 10%. And this is alarming as the consequences of, of, of the virus or, or, or COVID-19 might have forced more Syrian children uh, to leave their educational attainment and jump to the labor market to help their parents um, meet the, 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 the financial demands that they, they are um, working uh, to, 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 to provide or like secure. But at the same time, of course, uh, we cannot talk about the situation of Syrian children uh, in isolation from their parents' living conditions because these uh, go hand in hand. And just before the breakout of the virus, uh, the, it, was, it was stated that the monthly average expenditure of a forcibly displaced migrant household in Turkey was um, around 2,100 2, Turkish liras. And if, 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 if we take this, this amount of expen expenditure and um, take into account that the majority of forcible displaced, displaced migrants in Turkey, Syrians or not Syrians, um, work informally, and considering the poverty and extreme poverty indicators for middle income countries, we find out that there are around 49% of forcibly displaced migrants across the country living below um, the poverty line and 7% of them living under extreme poverty line. So this is something very serious. And um, the breakout of the pandemic just exaggerated this, 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 this situation because when the pandemic hit uh, Turkey, um, one survey showed that 69% of forcibly displaced migrants uh, the, lost their, their employment uh, opportunities. So this is something very critical. And our own research in the Economic Policy Research Foundation of Turkey showed that the number of Syrians who lost their jobs during the pandemic is four times higher than that of Turks. And the number of Syrians who were on unpaid leave is three times higher than that of um, citizens of Turkey. So this is when, when we say that the pandemic had forcibly displaced migrants uh, in a more profound way, this is one small example of what happened or how it impacted the lives of those who are in the labor market, for example. But we, we also should um, mention that there are around 10,000 companies, for example, established with at least one Syrian partner in Turkey. And the Syrian partners in, in, in these companies invested 1.5 billion Turkish liras in seed capital to set up the companies. And this is might, might be a little um, uh, slightly uh, outdated maybe because this is something we did in 2018, but our findings suggest that um, there are around 250,000 people who are benefiting from the advantages um, of employment by these companies. But of course, we need also um, to remember that while facing similar circumstances, uh, and this is something that uh, Professor Pernar mentioned. There are two questions that are synonymous with um, particularly Syrians in Turkey. The first of which is, will they, repat will they repatriate? And the second one, will they head to Europe if an opportunity emerges? Well, uh, I have to say that by now, uh, it's, it's becoming a reality that the majority of Syrians in Turkey do not want to return. And the, the Turkish... Uh, people or Turks, uh, they are also beginning to realize that this is becoming a part of their lives, that there are Syrians in the country and they are here to stay. And when we recall um, early last year, uh, Syrians were around a fifth or a quarter of the people who were at the Greek um, land border before um, the pandemic hit and, and, and uh, all countries around the world shut, shut their borders. So it's not only that Syrians do not want to repatriate, but um, the majority of them want to stay in Turkey and not move forward to Europe. Now, of course, uh, while Syrians are settling in Turkey for the last decade, and while doing so under hard and difficult conditions, uh, the perception of, of the hosting community signals the degree, let me say, of, of coexistence. And unfortunately, uh, Turks rank Syrians among Turkey's top 10 problems. Uh, and, and this is a position, in, in my opinion, that is stemming from different reasons. But I believe that the most critical of reasons is that Syrians are or have been integrating 
uh, by interaction and not by design, which 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 means that we don't we don't have a national strategy in Turkey or a policy uh, that oversees Syrians' integration in the long term. And this is a point that uh, Professor Penar. Uh, tapped upon at, 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 at her early speech by saying that you know we started from guests and then we jumped to temporary protection status and here we are now Turk uh, Syrians being among Turkey's top 10 um, problems and um, I, I want to finish by saying that the, the the conditions that I mentioned of first displaced migrants in Turkey are present while assistance programs funded by the EU are in effect and there are two um, important programs, uh, which are the emergency social safety net and the conditional cash transfer for education. Uh, while these programs are in effect and assisting the most vulnerable, I believe that the current talks of continuing cooperation between the EU and Turkey uh, is, is critical as, as, as the lives of millions of people are at stake, especially during last year uh, in the aftermath of COVID-19 breakout and uh, this year and maybe maybe uh, uh, well into 2020. And um, I, I think that continuing cooperation is necessary, but I think it also should be just uh, to include um, non syrians in the in the country as well because we, we i mentioned around 330,000 asylum seekers who are non syrians so this is something that should be included in the current um, negotiations and i believe that the renewed cooperation should remedy a critical asymmetric um, assistance that 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 that, that is the EU is supporting Turkey with 6 billion euros to look after 4 million forcibly displaced migrants in the, in, in the country. Whereas the EU, the same body, is supporting Greece with 3 billion euros to look after 120,000 asylum seekers. So this is an asymmetric um, situation that needs to be um, addressed um, effectively uh, in, in the negotiations, plus um, and aside from the need for fair financial support, um, if you ask me, the EU should stand up for its previous promises that 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 were made in 2016. And, and in particular, I'm talking about um, activating the voluntary humanitarian admission scheme because crossings between Turkey and the EU, and I'm quoting the statement now, um, have been substantially and sustainably reduced. So after all, I, I believe that promoting the European way of life as, as this new vice presidency have been created after von der Leyen took um, over the presidency should be about uh, advocate responsibility sharing uh, while um, safeguarding human rights. And I, I will stop here and um, I will be more than happy to answer um, the audience question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omar. Uh, Olivia, over to you. You can also uh, reflect on what has been said until now. Please go ahead. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kadri. And thank you to you and to the German Marshall Fund for organizing today's very timely discussion. Um, of course, last week marked five years since the inception of the EU-Turkey statement and discussions are ongoing on the form of the future relationship. So I think this makes it a very good time to discuss the past, the present and the future of EU-Turkey cooperation. Uh, so I want to start my intervention by looking back at the complex picture of the outcomes of the EU-Turkey statement. And whether this is a good or a bad picture depends very much on who you ask. On one hand, European policymakers, uh, in their view, the deal continues to be praised, to be seen as necessary, and deemed to work quite well from an operational perspective. Um, and the deal, of course, has many aspects. On one hand, to begin with, the 6 billion euro provided by the FREET, the facility for refugees in Turkey, is considered to be a large success. It has provided support with the livelihood, schooling and healthcare of over 1.8 million refugees in Turkey. And this makes it the EU's largest humanitarian project and also the aspect of the EU-Turkey statement that works the best on the ground. In terms of the other key objectives of the statement, uh, results are arguably more mixed. Arrivals from Turkey to Greece have fallen substantially compared to 2015 levels, although this is not without caveats. For example, most of this drop happened in the months before the statement was signed, and some of these have translated to pressure on other routes into Europe. Returns from the Greek islands to Turkey and the contentious one-to-one -one principle 
have never worked smoothly and less than 3,000 people have been returned to Turkey under the statement. And lastly, resettlement, the final part of the deal, has also seen modest results. 28,300 Syrian refugees have been resettled from Turkey into the EU, most of those to Germany. And this is clearly positive, and it bears noting that Turkey is the main country from which the EU resettles refugees globally. However, this also has to be taken in proportion to Turkey's efforts. Turkey continues to host 4 million registered refugees, including 3.6 million Syrians. So this means that the EU has resettled 0.8% of the current refugee population in Turkey. This, of course, remains very limited as an exercise in responsibility sharing, and it does little to provide credible and visible pathways to protection for refugees. So, all in all, for policymakers, this is a generally positive picture, although the implementation of the statement can be strengthened. On the other hand, for civil society, you see significant justified criticism for the deal, including in the past weeks. And this is for three primary reasons, I would say. On one hand, the situation on the Greek Aegean islands cannot be disentangled from the EU-Turkey statement. Since the deal was agreed, the freedom of movement of asylum seekers arriving in the islands was immediately restricted in various ways to implement the deal and facilitate returns to Turkey. And as we know, this trapped thousands of people in overcrowded, unacceptable living conditions, uh, which amounted to the gravest humanitarian crisis currently in the EU's territory, according to the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. So that is clearly one point of concern. A second is the question of whether Turkey is safe for refugees and for migrants returned from Greece under the statement. There have been concerning reports over the years of mass deportations of Afghans to Afghanistan, some collective expulsions of Syrians in 2019, uh, among others, which would make the EU complicit in indirect refoulement in violation of international law. However, the real issue is that we don't know in detail what happens because there are no structural reporting, monitoring, or evaluation mechanisms relating to the human rights implications of the statement. So in effect, people are largely returned and lost. And the third concern related to this is something that actually um, Pinar already referred to earlier. It's the legal nature and the scrutiny of the statement itself. The EU-Turkey statement is, in my view, part of a growing trend towards informal cooperation between the EU and partner countries, which are often not legally binding, not approved by parliaments, sometimes not publicly available, sometimes it's not even clear who the authors of the agreement are, and this makes it impossible to exercise democratic accountability or judicial scrutiny for these agreements, as has been the case for the EU-Turkey statement. So, all in all, bringing in these perspectives, it's quite a complicated partnership. And this brings us to the present of that partnership. Last year, we saw a significant escalation of tensions and provocations uh, between Greece and Turkey and the EU and Turkey, which has demonstrated the fragility of this partnership. Uh, Kadri, you already referenced uh, the incidents in February 2020 when Turkey announced it would stop patrolling the Greek Turkish border. Of course, the sources of contention also go beyond this, and they include the situations in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Cyprus, interventions in Syria and Libya, and the deteriorating domestic situation in Turkey. In recent months, we have also seen attempts to de-escalate, and both parties are trying to strike a cooperative approach, and the EU, for one, currently still favors a positive agenda towards Turkey. It's notable that even if tensions remain high, we are clearly moving towards a continuation of cooperation on migration. And there's been a flurry of activity in the recent weeks and discussions are now ongoing. So to recap where things start now, Turkey hosts more Syrian refugees now than when the agreement was signed. And there's no prospects for the safe return to Syria as Omar already highlighted. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the vulnerabilities of the Syrian population in Turkey, and indeed 70% of Syrian refugees in a recent survey reported losing their jobs during the pandemic. And all funds under the initial EU-Turkey statement have now been contracted, and most of it has been dispersed. So these factors together mean that there is a clear imperative to continue providing financial support into the future. Against this background, EU leaders stated in December 2020 that the EU is prepared to continue providing financial assistance to Syrian refugees and host communities in Turkey, and the Commission just prepared a report on the state of play of EU-Turkey relations, which also states that the Commission will prepare options for continued funding for refugees and host communities. So clearly, cooperation along current lines is set to continue. So 
With this in mind, I want to conclude by looking into the future and ask what we can expect in terms of upcoming negotiations. The first thing to note is that several divisions remain between the EU and Turkey in terms of the vision for future cooperation. For Turkey, some parts of cooperation can be strengthened. This includes progress on accession negotiations, even though it's broadly acknowledged that this is not realistic in practice. This includes visa facilitation and the customs union, where it perceives that the EU has not fully fulfilled its commitments under the statement. In terms of funds, Turkey generally wants them to be dispersed faster, wants a greater say in how they are spent, and would prefer direct budget support rather than the funds being distributed through NGOs and international organizations. And the final question is Syria. For Turkey, a big element in negotiations is how much support is provided directly in Syria to find a solution within the country and to promote returns from Turkey to Syria. And I would argue this is premature and difficult to foresee even in the long term because of the difficulties of returning to Syria and because people are integrated in their communities in Turkey. On the EU side, there's very little political appetite to revise the statement uh, and to add any new elements. And these three points are all very sensitive. Uh, so these are clearly several points that will still have to be hashed out in discussions, I would say. Um, and maybe as a final note, I want to just raise three points that I think will be interesting to look out for in negotiations and three key challenges that the future partnership will have to overcome. One first challenge is the question of how the EU can support Syrian refugees in the long term. Uh, what are the prospects for permanent protection in Turkey? How do you foster long-term integration and inclusion most effectively? How do you shift the priorities under the feet? And these are some of the questions that you know, we've already raised in the discussion so far. The second challenge is that it will be impossible to isolate migration cooperation from overall relations between the EU and Turkey. It will be crucial to improve mutual trust in general to prevent incidents like we saw last year and attempts to secure political leverage by encouraging people to cross the border, for example, um, and placing them at risk. And the last point that I think is another important one to make is that financial support for Turkey is only one part of a complex picture. The EU side also faces very difficult questions and needs to look internally too, not only looking to Turkey for answers. Um, resettlement needs to be expanded. As we've already mentioned, the situation on the Greek islands clearly needs to be improved, both in terms of reception conditions and responsibility sharing within Europe and allegations of pushbacks and violence by border guards, which are becoming increasingly common, need to be seriously tackled. So just to conclude, Clearly, cooperation uh, with countries of origin and transit is an important part of migration management, and this is also the case for the EU-Turkey relationship, but it doesn't replace the EU's responsibilities or opportunities for reform of its internal asylum and migration system. And this is one area that I think policymakers will also have to contend with in the future. I'll leave it at this, but more than happy to continue discussing. Thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, I, I encourage the audience to put their question. We, we are already receiving, uh, re have received many questions. Please uh, put your question uh, through the Q&A. But before open, uh, open up uh, for the Q&A, Pnar and Omar, if you would like to add something or reflect what has been said uh, by Olivia, uh, please go ahead, then I will open up for the Q&A if you don't have something. To add. I just want to add one thing, but sure. I mean, actually what he underlined, especially in terms of sort of difficulties that are been taking place with respect to COVID-19 is very important. And the problems, of course, uh, multiplied having this kind of risk for the vulnerable groups. And in Turkish context, vulnerable groups are not only Syrian. So this create a kind of competition yeah. among the poor and create further risk. So that in that sense, uh, to have in order to have sort of the real exercise of the rights that exist in the field and sort of to stop child labor and so on, we need to see these risks for the families and sort of trying to provide a livelihood for all vulnerable groups so that we can prevent uh, especially these risks for children and their continuous, uh, their way of continuing to education system. So uh, all, all these risks plus COVID-19 is something that we all have to face. I mean, no acknowledging that this is something universal problem for all of us but for the vulnerable groups the risks are much higher we need to acknowledge that mm. Omer would you like to add something on that or 
uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, Olivia mentioned a, the, a very good point, and very, which is very necessary, uh, and that is about building mutual trust between the two sides. And aside from all of those um, details that we briefly covered, I believe that Turkey cannot keep um, hiding behind its finger by saying that, you know, uh, the war will end in Syria because, you know, a decade has passed so far. And I think a good starting point of building or to build a mutual trust between the two sides is if Turkey actually works on uh, a policy of integration because we have the law on foreigners and international protection and it is described to be Turkey's first asylum policy uh, since joining the 1951 Geneva Convention, which is uh, a great progress. But at the same time, when you have an asylum policy, which is not complemented with an integration, harmonization, um, inclusion, whatever the term that is going to be used by the government to complement the legal governance and status of, 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 of people who are in Turkey, we will always be coming to the debate of like, okay, what's going to happen in the 10th anniversary of the EU-Turkey statement? Is Turkey going to continue funding uh, the projects that are um, offering assistance to Syrians or non-Syrians in the country. So while now we have the possibility of committing for new funds and extending the cooperation that we have since 2016, I think it's about time for Turkey to actually take a brave step and say to its public that this is our view for the next 5, 10, and 15 years of what we should do about Syrians in Turkey. And it, it, like maybe some of the audience would ask like is it the right time to do so with this like high level of polarization and like the backlash against Syrians well it was more convenient to do so maybe four years ago but if we keep postponing this based on the public backlash we will never come to the right time so maybe now is better than later and maybe it's now worse than than before but we need we need to make this brave step and like say that okay, this is our understanding of what integration should be. And we will do this in cooperation with the EU member states to help us with X, Y, Z sort of areas. And maybe that would be a good sign of like mutual trust building. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Well, I will uh, open up for the Q&A. Actually, Jose Pedro Tavares uh, is asking, I don't like to uh, change the question because if it was a in-person meeting, they would ask themselves. So I will just... Uh, quote uh, the question is seen that maybe the most significant positive output of the deal is that the number of migrants arriving in Greece has fallen significantly from 2016 to 2020. However, the number of refugees sent back from Greece to Turkey and the co corresponding number of migrants relocated from Turkey to the EU was relatively small. What what failed there? Would like to answer this question. Let's go ahead. What failed there, actually? Why it didn't work? Uh, maybe I can Rather, get yeah. started. Sure. Uh, well, as mentioned, um, of course, the arrivals have fallen, but it's important to take this with caveats. Um, some of them I mentioned earlier that on one hand, uh, the arrivals started significantly slowing down already in late 2015 and continued falling in early 2016, already before the statement was signed in March. So. There's a lot of discussion and research to be had as to the effect that in particular the statement had on that drop in arrivals compared to other measures. Um, and as mentioned, you know, recently we've seen the numbers starting to increase again in 2019. We've also seen more pressure in other routes, for example, from Turkey to Cyprus, from Turkey to Italy, at various points in the past few years through the Balkans route. Um, so there's really a lot of questions uh, to to look at in terms of arrivals. Um, but to answer your question in terms of what went wrong, in terms of returns, the factor that limited them the most, at least in the beginning, was that a lot of Greek courts blocked these returns because of international and EU law constraints and the ability to consider Turkey a safe third country. Um, a lot of the decisions made by appeals committees changed partly after the constitution of those appeals committees were cha was changed as a political decision, but that was one of the factors that significantly limited the returns. Um, now, the obstacles to returns are slightly different. For example, Turkey stopped uh, accepting returns from Greece last year in March 2020, citing COVID-19 um, as a reason. And this is one of the elements that the EU is trying to push forward uh, to resume these returns at a far larger scale, but they have really never taken 
uh, taken a large pace. Um, and the last question in terms of resettlement, why has this not been more significant? Um, indeed, as Omar already mentioned, the voluntary humanitarian admission scheme was never fully activated by member states and resettlement commitments have remained low. This is largely due to limited political will, I would say, uh, at the member state level, a lack of willingness to invest in resettlement opportunities. We see this from Turkey, but also from a large range of other third countries that host a large number of refugees. Some countries such as Germany, France, and the Netherlands do participate quite actively in resettlement efforts. Many other EU countries do not. Uh, so this is part of the reason why. Thank you, Olivia. Nar or Omar, jump in, please, if you like to add something. That. If not, I will bring another question. Uh, it's asked by Begüm Dönmez Essus. Uh, she says that some criticize the possibility for a new deal between Turkey and the EU, particularly in Germany, because a new deal would come at, come at the expense of a human rights issues in, Tur in Turkey. So given the current atmosphere in the term of recent political development in Turkey, as well as the state of play regarding uh, the relations between Turkey and the EU, what are the chances of a new deal? Who would like to answer this question? Go ahead, Omer. I mean, I think... I think it's 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 in the interest of both sides to continue cooperation on 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 the existing maybe framework if it is to be amended and maybe new elements will be added or the exist some of the existing elements would be um, taken out. This is something to be seen by the end of this week. But I think I mean Germany just just a week ago praised Turkey's role in 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 its um, in the 2016 deal. So. If we are to cite what is Germany's position or like what is the German pulse about renewing or committing to a new deal, it's it's obviously clear that Germans want to do so uh, because let's let's be honest uh, about one thing. Yes, there are many things that should be um, done maybe in a better way on on the Turkish um, side, but as just Olivia mentioned, we heard about many. Uh, coalitions of solidarity, for example, to take in people from Turkey uh, as resettlement. And then we have only half of um, the, the agreed upon quota on resettlement being fulfilled in five years. So it, nobody wants to see um, rubber boats taken off um, the Aegean coast on the Turkish side, going to the Greek side and having people drowning and losing their lives or being shot at as, as measurements of deterrence. So if we want to prevent that from happening, we need to continue working together. But is it an ideal situation to do so? I don't think so. But at the same time, I think it's better than nothing because nobody wants to have what had happened in 2016, not Turks, not Europeans. And most of all, we talk about now promoting European way of life. And while Turkey, in my opinion, has fulfilled many many points that are related to migration particularly the eu needs to step up its game first as olivia said like they need to clean up their um, um in-house uh division first and foremost and second of all it, it's in all of the member states interest not to repeat the drama of 2015 and 16 once again or like even what happened uh, a year ago so in that sense i i would conclude by saying that it is in mutual interest between two sides to continue working on this on this issue and working on it does not only mean injecting more funds it also mean how to improve existing shortcomings and how to make them um operate in in in, in a different and more positive way Thank you, Omar. Nar, would you like that? Yeah, just one I mean, thing. Ahead, I think uh, this whole like human rights issue is very crucial in the sense that all the problems that we are facing with respect to refugee crisis and all like the last year example. I mean, what we have witnessed, I can't really believe in 2020, we really witnessed that in the borders. So that was also a human rights violation. I mean, we need to be on the on that side. We all have to be very careful about this universality and what's going on in the field. So uh, yes, uh, in terms of the political developments, the recent things that are happening uh, are important. But at the same time, the livelihood or the risks the people are facing right now 
should be put on the table and that we need a common uh, sort of uh, sh sharing the responsibility and f trying to find common ways of how to deal with these problems. And not only for this particular case, but we know that in the long run with the climate cri uh, change crisis and so on, there will be more uh, human mobility all around the world. So we need to see it as a common human problem and therefore develop ways of uh, sort of really sharing responsibility perspective, sort of taking it into a real statement rather than just, sort of just lip service. So in that sense, I really think that we have to understand uh, the limitations and the problems that is going on and try to develop a better way of uh, providing services and of course uh, through the right framework, not a sort of temporary project based but rather, uh, as already stated uh, by Omer, like much more long run uh, so that people can see their future perspective, not limited from a sort of day to day survival level. And this is what we need to focus on rather than sort of just uh, thinking uh, kind of uh, solving uh, as a daily one day problem. Thank you, Pnar. A question to Pnar and Omer again from Gregor uh, Mikalski. Uh, what does the prospect for an intensifying presence and assistance on the ground in Turkey by international NGOs? And what, type, what, what kind of problems face international NGOs operating on the ground in Turkey? Go ahead, please. No, no one wants to answer. I can skip. No, no, no. I just want to understand. I couldn't understand the sort of, I couldn't read it, so I'm just trying to get the question. Yeah, uh, how, how, are you, how, is the, how are the conditions for the NGOs, uh, international NGOs working on migration in Turkey, actually? Oh, okay, okay. Um, I mean, uh, in the international NGOs need to get permission from the state uh, in general uh, to act in the field. And usually it would cooperation with local partners and so on. But with respect to migrants, with respect to uh, Syrians that uh, who are under temporary protection, there are a uh, number of NGOs that are currently uh, working. And usually uh, they get permission uh, through certain, um, I mean, limited geographical areas that they have certain uh, permission to work there within the existing uh, sort of limitation of that sort of uh, city or provincial or those cities and usually cooperate with the local NGOs but of course I mean there are also others who only uh, sort of work but uh, they need to get permission from the uh, state interior uh, ministry. Thank uh, you. I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Question to Omer uh, from Thomas Gruner. It says that you mentioned that the most of Syrian refugees in Turkey don't want to return to Syria no want uh, nor want to go to EU countries. Do you have any data confirmed that uh, he's asking? And then he continued, if the refugees want to stay in Turkey, is that only because the EU borders are largely closed or because they prefer to prepare their future in Turkey? Would many of them uh, want uh, to go to back Syria if the political situation it would be changed? Actually, you, you answered partially the question, but uh, if you want to add something, go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, I mean... Um, I will start from, from, from the latter end of, of, of the question to say that it's, it's, it's the way Syrians convey their, their um, repatriation aspirations is still linked with political transition and change in Syria. Otherwise, um, they explicitly say that there is no hope of us returning to, to where we came from. So I believe that that is, I mean, if, if we want to know what's happening in Syria, it's not the concept of security is not only about it's like you know classical definition of just like you know the absence of um, persecution or threat to life. Now Syria is facing grave um, economic conditions. People who are in the country are facing or in on, on the brink of, of starvation and in, like the economic condition is really really bad. So just a um, few months ago there was this this first international conference on the repatriation of displaced Syrians. And there was, it was almost boycotted by, by all of the international community because the conditions in Syria are not there yet to welcome back uh, the millions of Syrians, let alone um, the aspirations of Syrians who are in the neighboring countries saying that, well, we cannot go back as long as the political um, uh, status quo remains in, in, in its place. 
on the other side of of of, of this uh, or or the the, the question many Syrians went to Europe. Some of them came back to Turkey because they found it um, difficult to integrate and they believe that there is more um, sociocultural resemblance between um, their country of origin and what, what they experienced maybe briefly in Turkey. And this was one of the reasons why they came back to Turkey. But at the same time, there are Syrians whose family members managed to go to Europe and they cannot be reunified uh, with them, so this is on the on on the sh uh, let me say on the shoulders or the responsibility of EU member states to expedite family reunification programs, so they can bring those who are remaining in Turkey and and live as a, as a whole as one family. But at the same time, um, I, I believe why Syrians are not willing that that much to um to go to Europe anymore because many of them reestablish their lives in Turkey and to abandon this once again and start for the third time in a new place, maybe that is um, economically maybe better than, than being in Turkey. But like, you know, the, the, the idea of starting once again is, is really tiring and um, time consuming and effort consuming. And you're going to be in a new environment where like, you know, learning a new language once again and getting familiar with the um, socioeconomic um, conditions and culture is, is really um, uh, hard thing to do. So this is my perception of why Syrians may not be willing to um, to go to Europe anymore. And it's also a sign that what has been done so far, especially since 2016, is positive enough to have Syrians settling and and starting their lives over in Turkey. Thank you, Omar. This question. It can be for you, Olivia. Uh, Kila Terry is asking, what uh, ways are the failures or success of the EU-Turkey deal by products so for Europe's own uh, common European asylum system or its uh, neighborhood policy? Um, thanks a lot for the question. Um, I think it's slightly difficult to say where one starts and the other one ends in a way. Um, as I mentioned, Cooperation with Turkey came at a time in which the, you know, common European asylum system and the policies in the Greek islands were just being developed. So clearly, EU-Turkey cooperation had an impact on how the hotspots were being implemented, but clearly the failure to agree on a predictable responsibility sharing mechanism between EU member states also contributed to it. Um, so I would say that uh, it's, it's difficult to say, but, but clearly both of them had an impact. Um, there's been several efforts to develop, you know, greater crisis resilience in the EU's migration management system since then. There's, of course, now the proposals of the new pact on migration and asylum are on the table. Um, so I think it really, it's, it's a good moment to also look at the situation on the Greek islands and look at to what extent the policies that were in place failed may have been unrealistic. Uh, perhaps there was an expectation that Greece would be able to manage a lot better than it did with few resources and in very little time. And to ask whether the current proposals that are being made for the common European asylum system would fare any better. Uh, for example, the new PECS proposals include a new screening regulation and border procedures that would be mandatory at the EU's external border that is to a large extent based on what has been tried in the Greek islands. It's very similar to the admissibility procedures that were tested there and to the reception and identification centers or the Greek hotspots um, that are already there and are already being developed. So I think in terms of the humanitarian conditions on the islands, there's a very good question as to whether both the existing proposals uh, or the existing legislation and the proposals currently at play are partly to blame and perhaps they're too optimistic in terms of what states at the external border can handle. But I hope I've uh, more or less answered the, the question. Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Olivia. Another question to Nara and Omar uh, from Frederick Putman. How do you judge the level of integration? You have already uh, answered partially, but of the Syrian in Turkey, what do you regard as the main obstacle to long-term integration? Can I start with you maybe, Omar? Um, well, it's, it's, it's not an easy question to answer if you ask me, especially, not. <laughs> when, especially when, I mean, 
in, in, in academia, it's, it's very difficult to quantify integration to say like, you know, this is working and this is not working because of this and that, or like, you know, Syrians, or for example, are 75% integrated, like it's not um, that straightforward sort of um, answer. But I have to say that if we are to talk about how Syrians integrated or how well Syrians are integrated, we, we don't have a, a background to measure anything against to. And that's why I mentioned that we need to have a national integration policy or harmonization policy, whatever we want to call it. And then we can start saying that Syrians are well or not well integrated because we're going to have uh, an umbrella uh, to, to begin with. And then like we can look at um, labor market integration, um, cultural integration, so on and so forth. But while this backbone is absent, it's really difficult to measure how well Syrians integrated or not. But we agree about one thing. Uh, language skills of Syrians in Turkey are, are really um, below par, let me say. It's, it's, not, it's not as someone would expect after being I mean, so many people lived for different number of years in Turkey, but if there is one thing that 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 acts as a common denominator among them all is that they still speak more in Arabic compared to Turkish. And this is a sign that like everything, all of those courses that have been opened and supported by the Turkish government or why, in cooperation with the EU needs to be scaled. And if we scale them up just to offer language courses, it's not going to be that effective. They should be linked in 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 a in a way that resembles the European civic integration models that we have, because it should be a carrot and stick short sort of thing. Uh, if you learn um, language skills up to this level, you will have access to this sort of services, or maybe um, in 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 the um, utopian sense of like things in Turkey, a clear path towards citizenship, for example. So it should be structured in a way, as, as Professor Pernar said, so Syrians could see the light at the end of the tunnel from like five to 10 years from now. But if we could keep talking about um, project-based integration models, those are not gonna be effective and we will have, unfortunately, and I think this is something that might have started emerging already, we will have groups of Syrians who are quote unquote, once again, well integrated, and those who are left behind because those projects have not reached out to them uh, for lack of funds, for um, reach out um, shortcomings, so on and so forth. So it's very critical to have a backbone of, of what integration is about in Turkey and how it should be implemented and who are the stakeholders involved in it. And then we, then we can move to the next phase and say that, well, okay, Syrians are well integrated or not for the following reasons. Thank you so much, Omar. Uh, Pna, go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, just at some uh, points that while uh, Omar sort of underlying, I just thought about them. I mean, one thing is that um, Turkey, uh, though migration is part of uh, Turkish history, always Turkish Republic history, still the perception was more uh, internal, putting internal migration aside, uh, sending migrants. So this whole uh, receiving this much international migrants in its boundaries and sort of having this whole discussion of integration or rather the term now use this harmonization is something that had that really took a lot of time in Turkish context. But now, I mean, I think both uh, public uh, sort of institutions, uh, bureaucracy also sort of uh, sort of changed its mentality and sort of trying to, to some extent, uh, develop more uh, systematic or at least in terms of structural changes. But I think still in the opinions of the population and also in, in the uh, more of structural uh, sort of system of Turkey, that uh, the, how uh, we integrate those newcomers to Turkish uh, society and also to the whole system is an important, need a paradigm shift. I think that's something that we need to acknowledge. I mean, how to sort of uh, create a system in which we welcome the newcomers and sort of adapt uh, themselves to the existing system. And there, I mean, there are, of course, 100 things that we can discuss, but I just want to underline the importance of informality in Turkish context in many different senses, especially informal labor market that we have 
is very high. I mean, uh, it's uncomparable to many other countries. So this huge informal labor market both serves as a mechanism of kind of integration, of course, with many problems, with many risks, but at the same time, provide a way of uh, sort of uh, provide job opportunities, flexible job opportunities, fragile job opportunities, risk uh, with many risks. But at the same time, it somehow create a kind of livelihood. So that is also very important because this again uh, create one side a kind of integration, but not an integration or not an harmonization we will like to uh, see or design. And it's not only related to Syrians, of course, this had been always the case in Turkish context that we have this informal economy functioning, but it has a huge uh, impact on the, um, I mean, the rights and uh, security issues with respect to uh, risk that exist, especially in the one for vulnerable groups, such as seasonal or agricultural workers, uh, such as construction sector, uh, small workshop ateliers that you have uh, risk there uh, when you have this informal uh, sort of employment. But of course, I mean, as uh, uh, one needs to acknowledge that this also provide an opportunity space for them to gain a, a kind of uh, survival uh, sort of wages. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we have a decent humanly uh, conditioned work. So I think that side uh, is a very important dimension that we have to sort of uh, be aware of and should sort of develop mechanisms to monitor that, uh, that that is a necessity that we have to face. Thank you so much, Pinar. I think this question is really, the following one is really relevant for those who really think that the Syrian, they will uh, go to Syria or they should go. That is from Bashak Kale. She's asking uh, uh, what can be suggested for the EU to support the, the peace building or stability mechanism in Syria? Who would you like to answer this question? No one? So, so there's no hope for Syria to go back? You mean? I mean, I, 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 I would say that um, the EU is, 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 the EU's political position about this is very clear. They, they are linking peace building in terms of um, reconstruction and um, uh, repatriation of Syrians with a clear path uh, of political transition according to um, international resolutions. And while the EU is is setting its 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 request at that, that high, now we're talking about uh, or recently we talked about this um, international uh, conference in Syria to facilitate the repatriation of of Syrians. Uh, display Syrians to go back to Syria uh, and at the same time uh, there have been some 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 political visits to to Lebanon to Jordan and even to Turkey to expedite this process but I, I believe that nobody is willing to take a step um, further to, to to peace building before uh, the government in Damascus may be cooperates with its allies to show that okay this is going to be the steps for for um, a political transition and i think the way things stand we we have um, uh, presidential elections upcoming in july if, if they remain as, as scheduled and so far there are no hints that a political transition is is uh, anywhere to be seen so while we have this on the ground it's really difficult to talk about what Europeans could do to um, bring um, peace and start building Syria. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much. I will put some of questions just together because uh, as you know, sometimes Ankara is uh, accused of uh, using this uh, migration as a pressure uh, against the uh, EU. Some are asking if the, the, the Syrian are staying so they will stay in Turkey, in Turkey. So it means that Turkey lost this uh, uh, tool as a pressure or another question that is really related to this also, if, well, they are already uh, not in a good shape, but if the, the relations between Turkey and EU deteriorate, this can be still uh, seen and uh, become a, a pressure on EU, if we'd like to answer this question. Olivia, would you like to something on that? Happy to do so. Um, I think they're both very good questions. And I think it's important to bear in mind that 
already since before the statement was agreed and certainly consistently over the past few years as the statement has been implemented, there have been threats and, you know, political bargaining and coercive bargaining on both sides, in particular with Turkey threatening to open the border, as it were, uh, in multiple locations in order to try to secure greater EU support, uh, for example, for its plans to establish a safe zone in northern Syria, to try to get a faster disbursement of EU funds, to get diplomatic support for a military operation in Idlib. Uh, so, you know, last year when we saw Turkey stop patrolling the border, um, that was clearly a sort of show of force, and it is clearly something that was not new. Um, there had been threats that something like that would happen for quite some time. Uh, so I do think that that threat continues in a way. I think that that uh, reflected the extent to which cooperation between the EU and Turkey is intrinsically quite fragile and relies on mutual trust and relies on both parties deeming that they have more to gain from maintaining a good relationship and upholding the terms of the agreement than they do from trying to break it. Um, and I think this is unfortunate, but it's difficult to find a way around it. Um, and one of the reasons that I think it's unfortunate is that in addition to, you know, showing a breakdown in trust and the tensions that it led to at the border, um, it's also had very negative repercussions in the long term. So since then, we've already seen a significant militarization uh, and a deterrence policy being used in Greece in terms of its approach to asylum seekers arriving at its borders. We've seen a significant increase in pushbacks and more reports of violence in the way that those pushbacks are conducted since that incident in February 2020. Um, and, you know, a suspension of asylum procedures, a use of live ammunition and rubber bullets uh, by Greek border guards. So really, the consequences of that decision were quite substantially negative for vulnerable refugees and asylum seekers living in Turkey or attempting to cross into Greece, or even already within the Greek islands or mainland. So I think it's really paramount for these escalations and tensions to be avoided and trying to make relations more predictable and more sustainable would be one way to achieve that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Olivia. Another question from Jose Pedro Tavares. Uh, he says one of the practical consequences of the deal agreement is that the Greek police has frequently performed uh, illegal pushback on, uh, of migrants back to Turkey with Frontex and the commission turning a blond eye. Another practical consequences of the deal has been overcrowding, so, so, uh, substandard living condition, and extremely poor access to the services on the Aegean island. Will this be sorted in any new deal? What do you expect to happen or see happening in the future regarding this? Maybe I can Rather. come in on that as sure, well. Or... Of course. Um, so. Indeed, there is a, this comes very much in the context of the new PACS proposals, uh, which try, among others, to resolve these issues. Uh, first, in terms of pushbacks, the positive thing to say is that we have seen unprecedented attention at the political level towards the way that these pushbacks are being conducted. Um, so that is maybe the one good thing. Um, we've seen multiple investigations on the role of Frontex, the European Border and Coast Guard Agency. Many of them are still ongoing and it remains to see what the final outcome will be. Um, but, you know, investigating their involvement in pushbacks and also their internal uh, reporting mechanisms whenever abuses of human rights have been reported. So that's a positive. Um, we have seen growing condemnations by the European Commission of uh, you know, cases where pushbacks are suspected, although many claim that these are still insufficient. Um, there's been pressure on Croatia to establish an independent monitoring mechanism for pushbacks at the border because they've also been accused of conducting them for quite some time. So the positive thing is that there's more attention and more awareness of how these things happen. Um, in terms of concrete proposals, the commission as part of its uh, new pact package of proposals um, suggests to introduce an independent border monitoring mechanism, which among other things, seeks to limit pushbacks at the border. Um, however, members of the European Parliament and many NGOs and many academics have already warned that these are unlikely to be sufficient. Um, the reasons for that are, are many, partly because these instruments would not be independent. Uh, it would be member states themselves setting them up. So therefore it's unclear if they would be effective enough in enforcing uh, you know, any measures. 
It's unclear what happens if member states don't abide by these mechanisms recommendations. Um, it is unclear if they will be meaningful enough because of their limited geographic scope. So this monitoring mechanism would only happen at border crossing points, whereas of course pushbacks happen at sea, they happen in woods, uh, not just in the context of screening procedures. Um, and there's further questions over whether NGOs will be given access to border areas, will be able to submit complaints, etc. So the positive is that there's more attention. The question is concretely in practice, will these proposals do much to change it? And, and that's a very big question. Um, in terms of conditions on the Greek islands, again, there's a, a whole host of proposals relating to border procedures and solidarity um, in the new pact. Maybe too long to discuss in detail, but just to say that it is unclear if we will get very far in negotiations in the coming months because divisions between member states are still substantial. And even if we get there, there's a whole host of implementation and enforcement questions still to be resolved to see whether they will uh, lead to significant responsibility sharing in practice and a concrete improvement in reception conditions. Thank you, Olivia. This this question also is, I think, is really relevant because uh, uh, this is from Peter, uh, Peter Popchev. Uh, do you think that Turkey could do more about tackling the root cause of Syrian refugee exodus, or is it constrained by other regional and international security issues that Ankara resolve uh, through and uh, directly sustaining the Syrian conflict? No, you don't want to answer this question. Well. Uh, Skip is it's a, it's a geopolit it's about the more geopolitical. It's a difficult question. I, I agree. Maybe it's not your topic uh, of research. Uh, another question from uh, Kilia Terry. Uh, so she says the uh, Turkey LFIP uh, is based on Europe's uh, asylum key, which has uh, its own uh, faults, including the attainable Dublin regulation uh, rule of first arrival. Uh, do you see this as a EU exporting its uh, asylum regime and exploiting Turkey's eagerness to gain access to the EU? And can we uh, attribute some of the hardship in Turkey providing support for refugees and those under subsidiary protection to this uh, European adoption? No? Well, the the next one uh, maybe for you Olivia uh, what is the someone is interested particularly in uh, the situation in Bulgaria in the context of Turkey Greece border and the issue uh, issues and the EU Turkey statement do you, do you have any information about this because we are generally speaking about Greece Greek border but uh, no one speak about the Bulgarian border. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't want to evade the question. Um, so I'll try to answer it, but I may be brief because it's not my expertise. Sure. Um, there's, of course, there's been questions over how other EU member states come into cooperation with Turkey because indeed the EU Turkey statement focuses on, you know, the migration flows between Turkey and Greece. Um, it's interesting because, for example, last year when Turkey stopped patrolling the border, it encouraged migrants to attempt to cross towards Greece. Uh, but surprisingly not towards Bulgaria, even though they share the land border. So that was something that garnered the attention of a lot of people and, you know, wondered if that's because of the close relations between the two countries or what it is that's causing it. I don't have the answers, but it's just a flag that indeed it's an interesting question of how the relationship changes with it. Um, maybe one further point to make, and this is not specific to Bulgaria, but perhaps also the case with Cyprus, is that if there's ongoing negotiations or discussions on future cooperation on migration management, um, these countries are also quite likely to push for um, you know, Turkey to stem migration flows to them as part of the agreement, not only to Greece. Um, Cyprus, for example, is concerned that border controls with Greece are pushing more people to try to enter via the Cyprus land border with Turkey, um, where the island is partitioned. So that is you know, one point of contention, is what is the impact going to be on other third countries that, from which migrants can also travel from Turkey? But I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have more answers. Than no, that. Thank you so much. It's great, uh, Olivia. Thank you. A uh, question maybe for you, Omar, uh, from Alan Makovsky. Uh, you have already, uh, in your introductory remarks, spoke about this. But so, so how well the, are the Syrian students integrating in the Turkish schools? Uh, and is, 
any studies of this? Uh, what has been the impact of Turkish attitude toward the Syrian community in view of increased strain on Turkish educational uh, system? If you want to add something, uh, you have already mentioned in your introductory remarks, but please go ahead if you want to add something more. Um, yes, of course, and thank you for the question. I, I think that there is um, a great pressure on the Turkish um, educational system because, as 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 I mentioned in my my remarks at the beginning, we're talking about 1.1 to 1.2 million Syrians in the schooling age, and only 63 percent of them are enrolled in schools. Now, this signals that there is maybe a structural capacity that needs to be addressed in the sense of maybe we need more schools to accommodate those who are out of schools. And at the same time, it cannot be viewed in isolation from, from the um, economic conditions of their parents. But the fact remains that there are around 400 to 450,000 Syrians who, are, should, who should be in schools and they are not at schools. So um, there is definitely an immense um, pressure on, on Turkey to accommodate and um, address the needs of, 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 of hundreds of thousands of students to um, attain their educational attainment. But every now and then we hear that, or the, this, the structural capacity problem should also be um, addressed along with, um, let me say, skills building for, for teachers, because uh, you dealing with students with um, uh, foreign background is not as easy and straightforward as dealing with native students. We have language um, difficulty, we have bureaucratic issues as well that, um, for example, if someone who is at the age of 11 and should be at uh, one grade, they do not have enough documents to demonstrate that they finished their previous education levels, how they should be placed uh, at the school and according to what um, criteria. So this is also something that needs to be addressed as well. And aside from that, well, uh, every now, like a number of research showed also that there is peer pressure uh, that Syrian students face. And um, in, in one unfortunate incident, maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago, one Syrian student committed suicide. It was not concluded that it was because of peer pressure, but it, it was said that it played a role uh, into that unfortunate incident. And at the same time, uh, having this uh, talks or like how what is the impact of, of Syrian um, students on the Turkish educational system we I have to say that uh, there there were structural shortcomings let me say before the influx of, of Syrians to Turkey which only um, been highlighted after Syrians started entering or infiltrating um, the official um, Turkish educational system and aside from that as I also mentioned before, there are in, in, in place mechanisms to support Syrians to remain at schools because being enrolled, again, is one thing. Attaining school or like being at school or attending school is an, another thing. And here, the financial um, capacity of their parents to support their children to remain at school is, is the, the, the biggest issue. So like it's, it's a, a, a domino of things. Uh, that needs to be addressed when we talk about just the educational attainment of Syrians. And this shows the complexity of what Turkey has been dealing with for the last decade. Thank you so much, Omar. Yeah, like, go ahead. Omar. yeah just, I, I have just the two points. One thing is like the school climate is very important for keeping the school students at school. So for all the migrants, uh, children of migrant families, as we all know from different experiences in different countries that sort of this integrative, more inclusive education system is necessary for both peer pressure and also ways of teachers, how to deal with it. I mean, how to create a sort of much more uh, welcoming atmosphere in this in, within class. And the second dimension is also related to, with the parents, like sometimes as from the field uh, research that we have done so far, that sometimes the students themselves are the translators uh, to their mothers. So they are the ones who have to deal with the problems, try to explain that to their mothers and fathers. So this, this even that very simple sort of uh, intervention is very crucial, sort of providing uh, translators to teachers or headmasters so that they can have this dialogue without having the children sort of taking that active role. So many things need to be developed in that sense uh, in order to have 
higher uh, sort of uh, continuous, not, not sort of dropouts, but sort of a continuous uh, well received education. These are, of course, plus including this economic support, sort of financial situation of the parents. I think this following question is important again from Bashak Kale. I don't know, uh, have you seen this? Uh new kind of uh, proposition for a new deal uh, from European Stability Initiative from Gerald Krauss, uh, who is uh, one of the architects of the, this deal, the current deal actually. So she's uh, saying that the, the document suggests that the many issues have to be conditional for Turkey to create impact on, the, on a new version of the deal. Does the panel think that the extended conditionality for Turkey to receive funds, resettlement, etc. will work? I, I wonder if it might be possible, Kadri, to clarify sure. the question slightly about what what types of conditionality uh, it's referring to. Well, uh, unfortunately, I deleted the message <laughs> after asking the, the question. Uh, I hope Bashak will write again the question, uh, but within time I will ask another question. I'm so sorry. Because, because there are too many questions that I'm just... After asking, I'm just deleting the question that I, I didn't get it. I will. Bashak will do it. Thank you so much, Bashak. So uh, another question to you, maybe, Pnar. Uh, so Jasper Portimer asking, what does Turkey get out policing the border for Europe? Uh, the EU makes a big deal uh, out of its giving uh, Turkey 6 billion euro. But Ankara says that it's a fraction of how much he, uh, it has spent on the migrants. So if the EU money isn't important, why does Turkey maintain the agreement? It's a, it's a quite good question. question. I mean, actually, uh, <laughs> for me, these questions are difficult because in the sense that I usually uh, feel like reframing the questions or reframing the whole discussion because I actually feel uh, the opposite, like why not uh, to have all the other, the rest of the countries or other UN agencies to take a more active role and sort of to change the whole situation to a better version. So my, my framing is rather than, I mean, why not uh, we all uh, sort of uh, develop a more better mechanisms where people have less difficulty in sort of uh, setting up their own lives and sort of uh, having access to do all the, the rights that we have been sort of dealing like health or education. But I think one of the key things that I would like to underline with respect to the this whole six billion story is I think transparency is crucial. I mean, both for the Turkish, I mean, Turkish public opinion, because this is also another dimension that we have been dealing in the field in terms of anti-immigrant attitude, that almost all the time we have the scapegoating for the unemployment that exists in Turkish context, or uh, when they have a problem in the uh, sort of hospitality, they blame the Syrians because they, ha they are there, we don't have the enjoy the same rights, they got our rights and so on. So even for that level, like the, uh, the whole uh, um, transparency in terms of where the aids come from or where the sort of in, in which projects these are supported from foreign funds and sort of what is the actual amount of money that is spent and so on. Uh, not only, of course, on the issue of uh, sort of refugee crisis, but in general, I mean, uh, this transparency uh, is crucial to see sort of uh, successful uh, projects or what are those costs that exist in the field. So I think in that sense, this question for me that I would like to underline is this whole um, information that is needed for all of us to see what is actually going on in the field in terms of both uh, budget of it. I mean, of course, now we're talking about Turkey, but for every country context, uh, sort of the real uh, budget control or to see the expenses so that we as citizens, we as those who are living in that uh, territory will have a better detailed knowledge of what is going on. And in that sense, again, this with 6 billion, of course that I personally think that it should be much more transparent to see uh, which projects it is uh, sort of spend on and how to what extent some of them are more successful as we know in the field somehow more having difficulties in implementing so that uh, sort of to know um, the 
better cases, better implementation, again, not for only Turkish context, but for all other countries that may have and benefit from that experience. So this will be my sort of <laughs> again and again a point that I want to underline for all the country context for to stop anti-immigrant attitudes increasing. We need to be very transparent in terms of these. But uh, actually, we know that in many other country contexts, including Turkey, that this also had used in terms of uh, politicians using it as a tool, as a sort of depending on the argument, depending on that uh, populist moment of that time. Uh, these issues are used and reused again and again. Thank you so much, Pranar. Well, I haven't received yet a question from Bashak, but my colleague sent me by a, a chat uh, function. Actually, she, she's not mentioning the, the, the uh, which kind of conditions. She's just saying that the, the document suggests that many issues have to be conditional for Turkey to create impact on the new version of the deal. Does the panel think that the extended conditionality for Turkey receive funds, resem, uh, resettlement, etc., will work. But she's not mentioning which kind of conditionality, and I don't know which kind of condition conditionalities are in the documents, actually. But uh, I would like to add some other question, uh, particularly for you, Olivia, uh, so maybe you can answer uh, together. Uh, are you, uh, Latoya Waha, asking, are you aware of information sharing intelligence? refugees, data, etc., being part of the EU-Turkey deal. She's asking this. And there's another question from Olga Triu. Um, she's saying, do you think that the EU should take on a yearly basis a certain amount of Syrian refugees to Europe in order to support Turkey and improve the life of Syrian refugees and show goodwill, build trust with Turkey? Please, very brief. We are just arriving to the end and uh, then we will uh, close the meeting. Thank you. Olivia, go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, first, in, in terms of conditionality, as, as mentioned, I'm sorry if I've misunderstood anything. Uh, but to my knowledge, indeed, the document calls for uh, some elements of you know, human rights monitoring, for example, to make sure that returnees uh, to Turkey are then treated in full compliance with international law uh, and with refugee law to make sure that they're not you know, immediately deported or the denied the right to apply for asylum, as is something that has happened in the past, allegedly. So I think some of these conditions are uh, important uh, and, you know, would certainly be useful going forward. But the key question is going to be the establishment of structural monitoring mechanisms uh, so that, you know, the consequences and practice uh, for returnees can be monitored. And this is something that is not systematically in place and also not in a way that is publicly available so that NGOs can also check what the actual outcomes of, of the statement are, for example. Um, so I hope that I've answered at least part of the question. Um, the other question, um, am I aware of information sharing between the EU and Turkey? Um, unfortunately, I am not. Um, there's, of course, the expectation that, uh, you know, there's constant committees and, you know, meetings between the EU and Turkey in which they discuss technical aspects of return and readmission, for example, under the statement. Um, my understanding is that these have not been working systematically well and that uh, discussions and, you know, open dialogue between the EU and Turkey haven't gone very well. But in terms of the sharing of personal, you know, sensitive data, whether people have applied for asylum or not, um, I, I don't know this, unfortunately. Um, and lastly, there was a question in terms of uh, whether the EU should commit to taking in a certain number of refugees resettled from Turkey per year. Um, of course, this would help in terms of responsibility sharing. Um, I would just caution one point, which is that as mentioned, the EU already resettles a lot more Syrian refugees from Turkey than it does from any other country that is hosting refugees. So it's important to make sure that resettlement is something that continues to support those refugees that are most vulnerable and not primarily be guided by migration management objectives, as is a risk that we see with instruments like the EU-Turkey statement or you know, current EU proposals under negotiation shifting the balance as to where the EU chooses to resettle refugees from. Uh, if it ignores the countries, for example, in Africa, that also host a large number of refugees simply because they're not key negotiating partners in the same way that Turkey is, then we're creating prote protection blind spots and areas in which other people that are also refugees from war, living in countries that do not have the resources to provide them with protection are not getting the support that they need. So of course, I think increasing the EU's resettlement commitments is an absolutely positive step that should be taken. Um, but I think there's some care that needs to be taken as to the countries from which 
uh, refugees are resettled to make sure that it's not only those that are relevant negotiating partners such as Turkey. Uh, I hope I've answered the questions. Thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, we have to, um, unfortunately, there are still questions uh, and I apologize because we, we are just around to the end and I, I have to uh, wrap up. Uh, but I would love to like to thank you, Omar, Pnar and Olivia. Thank you so much, uh, really, for joining us and Uh, making this conversation work. It was really, really uh, interesting. And, and I learned personally a lot. Thank you so much uh, again. And I would like to also thank to my colleague, uh, Anika and William for uh, helping uh, with this uh, meeting. And above all, I would like to thank you to all uh, the audience for joining and for contributing uh, to this discussion with their question. Uh, so uh, hope to see you again and thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.